hope you're all well during this uh, very challenging time with the COVID-19 pandemics. Uh, we, uh, last semester, we were uh, forced to stop this lunchtime seminar at the end of the semester, in the middle of the semester, and I hope you're all keeping well. Um, although we have been uh, organizing different webinars on different topics uh, in the last few months. Um, the uh, good thing is that we're able to have a wider audience, in fact, an uh, audience from international, um, you know, international uh, platforms. We've been having a, a Actually, the, the three webinars we had in the last two months have more than thousands of people participating with us um, from almost every continent of the, the world. So this is one silver lining coming from the uh, COVID-19 challenge. So today, we're really, really happy to see all of you here to join us. Uh, we see all the students coming back from the campus, uh, people joining us uh, and uh, some old friends and some new friends. Thank you so much for coming together with us. Uh, CFPR will continue to have our lunchtime seminar uh, almost every Friday and you'll be receiving notice uh, uh, messages from us. Um, we also want to uh, announce that uh, just today we have issued our uh, CFPR um, newsletters uh, that were that have been sent out uh, through our um, social media on Facebook, uh, on LinkedIn, and so on. So uh, please check that out uh, after the, the talk and uh, keep, keep updated information with us. So today uh, we are so happy to have a very distinguished professor with us, um, all the way from China. Um, <laughs> uh, Professor Du Pong with us. We're so grateful, Professor Du Pong, for joining us. Uh, we regret that uh, the, the trip that we had planned last semester didn't uh, come to fruition, uh, but we're so happy to see you uh, online and uh, to share with us your, your research on aging um, in Asia and, and more broadly in uh, well, more specifically in China. So Professor Du ha has a very distinguished uh, career in his research on aging. He is the vice president of the Renmin University of China. He's the director and a professor of the Institute of Gerontology in Renmin University. Um, he has a long list of titles uh, throughout his uh, distinguished careers. Currently, he is the uh, Vice President of China, uh, Chinese Gerontology and Geriatric uh, Society, Vice President of the China Population Association. Uh, he has been a member of expert in committee, uh, the Ministry of Civil Affairs, board member of the Help Age International uh, in, during 2008 and to 2016 and also the board member of United Nations International Institute on Aging since 2008. He has served as the chair of the International Association of Gerontology and Geriatrics Asia Oceania region from 2009 to 2013. His research interest is wide ranging but quite focused on population aging and the aging policy. His pop, uh, recent publications include The Process of Population Aging in China, The Older Persons in China, Social Gerontology in EU Countries, Population Aging and Aging Issues, uh, Population Aging Change and Challenges, Disabled Persons and Their Social Protections in Rural China, China's Population in the 21st Century, and so on. So as you can see, this uh, uh, a lot of uh, aging research, not only uh, in on China but also other regions in uh, in Asia as well. So today we're very lucky to have uh, Professor Du Peng to come and talk to us about the development of aging policies and the long-term care services in China. 
So uh, Professor Du will have um, about half an hour to share his work with us, and then we'll open up the uh, question and answer period. And you are probably familiar with the Q&A at the bottom of the, the screen that you can send in your questions, and we'll, we'll try to uh, uh, ask those questions on your behalf to Professor Lu Du during this period of time. So without further ado, uh, we thank uh, Professor Du again for uh, joining us and uh, so graciously agreed to participate in this uh, sharing. So Professor Du, please, uh, for your presentation. Thank you so much. We usually clap and now I don't know how, what do we do this? <laughs> thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Yang and also the center for giving me the opportunity to share our uh, recent uh, research findings on the policy and uh, long-term care services. So I will share my screen uh, to, can you see that? Can you see the yes. screen? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, to share our uh, research findings on the development of aging policies and long-term care services in China. Firstly, uh, I will introduce about the background so you will understand why we have so many policies and what are the strategies to tackle the issues uh, currently in China. And then the situation of long-term care services. Second part, I will uh, introduce about the development of policies on aging and also what kind of uh, uh, problems still uh, we need to improve or overcome uh, uh, for the current uh, policy uh, theories. And the last part will be the new uh, strategy in China to use the uh, new concept uh, of social governance of aging society because not just uh, long-term care uh, or productive aging, but uh, general aim of the country. What, what, what's the goal for the country to achieve uh, under the sustainable development goals? So that's my uh, mainly the three parts. Uh, first, uh, I will introduce the, the key figures of uh, uh, population aging. The first, uh, so maybe you'll see uh, China's population will stop increasing uh, in about 10 years and the peak population will be about 1.45 billion. Currently it's uh, 1.4 billion. So uh, another 50 million increase expected. And then we will have a decrease of the population. At the same time, uh, currently we have more than 254 million older persons. By law, 60 and over is regarded as the older persons in China. If we use the 65 for older persons, currently it's 176 million, account for about 12.6% by now. And expected in two years, it will be about 14%. Uh, with the uh, UN uh, Sustainable Development, uh, Development Goals, uh, after that, China announced Healthy China 2030 by the State Council in 2016. There are, man there are many key figures, key goals to be listed in the Healthy uh, China Statement. One uh, indicator is by 2030, try to achieve the life expectancy at birth to 79 years. Currently, uh, by the end of last year, it's 77.3. And then uh, we will sh I will show you the population projection by 2065 uh, under the current uh, life, life expectancy uh, projection. And also the universal two-child policy implemented since 2016. Uh, in fact, uh, after that, the goal of the new policy is to try to have two children. Uh, on average, the TFR is expected to keep at 
but by last year, it's only 1.5. So still uh, many arguments whether we should have more policies to encourage the families to have more children. So that's the background. Uh, under that background, uh, for long-term care services. Uh, in 1994, for every year, by the State Statistics Bureau, we have the uh, annual survey on the ADL problem. So from year 2000, every 10 years, we have a census. Uh, the question is about the self-rated health, uh, namely, uh, ADL issues or whether they regard they are unhealthy or healthy. So the latest data will come from next November. Uh, they will use the, uh, the new uh, data collection system, the iPad, to get the new data. Uh, so that will also include the ADL problems and the health uh, status in the latest uh, uh, census we expected. Uh, for in the past uh, 26 years, the, especially from the census data, the old persons with ADL problem difficult, uh, uh, difficulties is about 3%. That means these 3% old persons, they cannot manage uh, independent living by themselves. So they need long-term care. In addition to that, another 14%, they can manage the, their daily life, but they need help. So it's the target of the community services for these uh, people. So generally about 17 together, they need care. Uh, another 83%, usually they regard themselves as healthy, all uh, pretty good uh, for the health status. Uh, the key reason for the increasing care needs is the shrinking family size and more and more uh, uh, old persons living separately from their children. Uh, even in the large cities, because young couples, they have their new apartments, so they tend to live separately from their parents. And the huge amount of a floating population, emigration from rural areas or from the central or western part of China, uh, the total amount is around 250 million. So huge population. Also caused uh, the problem worse because they tend to stay in the uh, urban areas and they don't want to return back to their hometowns. So usually in villages, you can see a huge proportion of old persons living alone. By 2020, uh, the latest figure by the Ministry uh, of Civil Affairs to show uh, nationally, we have uh, about 22.3 thousand nursing homes. They are professional nursing homes. Uh, so with uh, 4.29 uh, million buys and uh, 2.15 million old residents in the nursing homes. Why I list that as uh, uh, the right color? Uh, if you calculate that with the total amount of Chinese old persons, it's very interesting to find only uh, less than 1% old people, they are living uh, in the nursing homes. And uh, even for the nursing homes, uh, on average, every nursing home has about 100 buys. For the uh, 100 buys, maybe only uh, uh, half of them are occupied. So uh, every level, we can't pro, uh, make use, uh, full use of the, the nursing homes to provide the services. So that's the, the latest figures and we can see the challenge, uh, not, not just to have enough number of nursing homes, the buys, but how to provide professional high quality services to uh, help these old people. And then uh, for the future, 
so uh, we expect to have a full, uh, say, uh, 412 million old persons by 2035. And by 2050, the number will be 480 million uh, for those 60 and over. So huge number, uh, the old persons will be doubled by today, comparing to today. today. So that's the uh, background of why the government uh, will have so many policies to deal with the, uh, the challenges. So the proportion by 2050 uh, of the old people, uh, it's about 38%. Uh, Comparing to Singapore or to Japan or Korea, Japan and Korea will be about 43% uh, by 2050. So China will be lower than Japan, Korea, and Singapore by that time. But still, it will be doubled comparing to nowadays. Another figure I want to highlight is the 80 and over, the oldest old population. By currently, it's uh, 30 million. And by 2035, it will be doubled. By 2050, it will keep stable at 101 million uh, old per, uh, oldest old. So uh, if we calculate uh, with the 3% old people with the EDR problem. So uh, there will be uh, the care need for the EDR difficulty of old people will be 14 million. They need uh, at least this number of old people, they need long-term care at home or maybe at the, uh, at, at the nursing homes. So uh, this figure shows the, the bars, shows the uh, number of old person, and uh, the line shows the uh, proportion. So by 2065, uh, the proportion will be stable at 40%, but the old persons uh, will decline after 2055. So the peak will be around 2055. So uh, close to uh, 500 million, but uh, maybe lower than that, or we, if we have a better health improvement, maybe around that number. So uh, for oldest old, we can see a rapid increase, uh, both the figures and the proportion by 2065. With that background, uh, we can see the development of policies on China. Uh, basically, active aging policies is the, the strategy for the whole policy uh, uh, system nowadays in China. So try to uh, keep the health participation and the security opportunities to maximize uh, this process. I want to highlight uh, uh, before I introduce the, the exact uh, policies, two overarching, uh, the two national strategies I want to mention. The first is the uh, National Population Development Plan uh, released by State Council uh, three years ago. Uh, two keywords uh, in that, uh, two sentences. So one is the, uh, the government will improve the policy adjustment and the mechanism for childbirth, that's, that's try to increase the total fertility rate. And then uh, allocate public service resources rationally that try to narrow the gap between the urban and the rural or regions. Improvement, uh, improve development and support systems for family and achieve, to achieve a sustainable fertility rate. So that's clearly stated uh, by the national uh, plan. Uh, so uh, and for details, they try to have a comprehensive system of social security, old age services, health support, and a livable environment. That's one in very important national strategy. The second is uh, recently, uh, by the, uh, it was released last November, 
so uh, also by the state council, uh, it's called the, uh, the medium and the long-term plan for responding proactively to population aging. So four, five key elements this state. One is to have a more uh, financial, uh, social, uh, more sustainable uh, social security system. Because nowadays almost 300 million older persons, they enjoy the pensions. So the argument is try to have a higher and higher uh, pension level. But uh, national policy, national strategy, firstly, to emphasize to have a sustainable social security system. Second, uh, about the shrinking labor force, try to uh, establish a lifelong learning system for senior citizens and striving to achieve fuller employment and create better quality jobs. That's the countermeasure to shrinking labor pools. The third is the high quality services for the elderly, including the health, education, disease prevention and treatment, rehabilitation, nursing, long-term nursing, uh, and uh, hospice care should be established. The fourth is to uh, emphasize the technology to use that to uh, for the public aging, uh, including strengthening uh, the development of assistive technologies for senior citizens. And uh, the fifth is to have a social, uh, more friendly environment for the senior citizens, uh, because with better and better social welfare system, whether how to overcome the, uh, the stereotypes, uh, that means the, to regard the old people as the burden of the society, how to enable them to participate in the social development, that's also a key strategy in the national uh, uh, plan. So that's two uh, uh, general strategy for the aging policies. Currently, we have, uh, uh, in the past uh, three or four years, we have more than 100 uh, ministry policies or national policies for aging. Uh, generally, the policy priorities, uh, one is to narrowing the gap between the urban and the rural areas, both for pension or medical insurance or uh, care services. The second is increasing efficiency of service integration and the delivery faced by the uh, elderly care services. We, we do have a lot of services for the elderly, but maybe the most needed uh, services nobody provide there. But for cultural activities, for some uh, uh, other not so helpful for those uh, uh, ADL difficulties, uh, they are provided. So it's not so efficient. Uh, so the policy try to focus on efficiency of the services. And the third is to change the, the idea to social governance of aging societies. Because at the beginning, in the, in the, from 1950s to 1990s, it's the, it was the go uh, government's uh, obligation to provide these services. And then in the past 20 years, uh, they leave, leave that to the market. But now they try to uh, combine the two efforts, uh, especially to, to have the grassroots level, older persons, to, have, to hear from them what, what are the most needed uh, help. They want to have their services there. So that's an idea change from a planned economy to the market economy and now to a new form of social governance of the aging society. So uh, we can summarize that from four perspectives uh, if we talk about active aging policies nowadays in China. One is for social security, uh, that's one uh, bottom line part, and then the individual health and the personal ability for uh, every perspectives. 
and then to emphasize the social environment because for age-friendly cities, for social participation, for respect for the old people, if you just have the social security, you can't enable them to be respected by the society. So the education, the cultural activities, the intergenerational relationships, they are all uh, very important parts in this social environment. So practices, uh, I want to highlight several uh, characteristics by now. The policy focuses uh, mainly on social security. We have uh, most, uh, so the, the figure on the right side shows the number of the policies. You can see the, the, the big, uh, big, uh, biggest amount of policies is about the social security. And for personal uh, ability or individual health or social environment, uh, we do have some policies, but comparing to social security, still we need a lot. Um, uh, the policy on aging generally is still lagging behind the development of population aging because when we have some uh, very uh, serious uh, problem and then we have some policy to deal with that. In fact, for population aging by 2050, by 2065, we already know the, uh, the future. We should have some policies uh, in advance, not just follow that. And then for the uh, policies, uh, the active aging policies in the process of dynamic change, that means it's uh, developing uh, and from the, uh, the prominent feature is the gradual promotion of the level and the standard of security. And now we have uh, various kinds of security from the bottom uh, line guarantee for those poverty uh, to the uh, higher level of uh, security, social security, uh, and the, the pension level raised steadily in the past 16 years. Every year we have about 5% to 10% increase of the pension level. Uh, uh, for long-term care insurance, since 2015, we, had, we have already started the 15 city pilots in fact, uh, this year, it should be expanded to more cities, but due to the COVID-19 pandemics, it's uh, affected a little bit. And then for the load income support, I listed some uh, key figures by now for those, because uh, the, the government announced that by the end of this year, we will eliminate the absolute poverty uh, so older persons uh, is a key part of this poverty uh, population. So that's the key figure. Uh, they already provide support for these people. And then for the whole system of the, the aging policy, uh, it's a, a multi-layered uh, network is maturing, uh, including the lifelong learning, uh, livable environment, care services supply, uh, sewer industry, prefer preferential treatment for the elderly, and uh, long-term care insurance. And then for the uh, uh, elderly services and uh, service system, I want to mention uh, it focuses uh, the big fundamental change is the uh, integration of home, community, and institutions. Why I'm talking about that? Because at the beginning, people talk about whether we should rely on the institutions to provide care. And then, in fact, uh, the traditional model in China is to depend on the uh, family members to support for the elderly. So and now after so many years arguments, uh, now the general uh, idea is to see to uh, seek the integration of the three models, not just uh, only emphasize one part and uh, uh, and uh, criticize another one. Elderly service system is evolving from the traditional family support 
to socialized and market driven services. And then the last part is the governance of aging societies. Uh, so the framework is to deal with the challenges, uh, we should have the life course perspective, namely not just focus on the poverty of the old person, because when they had the poor health, uh, we have to follow that to the occupations before they entered the old age. And then we find before the occupation, they may have um, they may have a poor education, and before the education background, maybe they had a poor, uh, uh, say, rural uh, life experience. So if we have the uh, life course perspective, we can do a lot, not just that the old age, to prevent the poverty, to encourage the social participation in the later lives. And then for the age-friendly environment, uh, the whole idea is to have to give them the opportunity to at the home and also for the outside uh, uh, social environment, uh, especially to encourage the whole society to respect the old population. It's a big challenge. I will talk uh, a little bit more about that. And then the more policies needed to, uh, especially to empower the old persons, not just to give them the welfare, uh, to hear from that, to, to get the feedback from them. Uh, because by 2050, uh, our research funding found the old person with a higher education background will be more than 18% by 2050. These new cohorts of old people, they will have more uh, uh, rights. They want to have more voice heard in the development of the aging policies. So the, for the government, uh, governance of aging societies, uh, so one, uh, we should strengthen the top level system design, constructing social governance system of the aging uh, policy uh, to uh, especially to encouraging policy uh, innovation to promote grassroots service programs for the elderly, promoting sustainable care and community care. Because more and more experience in China come from the grassroots innovations, not from the central government, but the central government may summarize the good uh, practices to uh, summarize that as national policies to encourage that. The second is to have the life course perspective to guide the policies and the practices, especially for health promotion, disease promotion, and also the management of chronic disease. Uh, developing a reasonable financing system, we try to uh, advocate to have uh, uh, professional industry standards and also talent team for the further development. Uh, so that's uh, another part for the human resources. And uh, for the old persons to create a, a good social and cultural environment for the social participation of the elderly. Uh, I want to, uh, in addition to age-friendly modification of livable environments, I want to uh, focus on the internet interaction uh, and the digital divide. Uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, in fact, if you go out of the communities, they will ask you to show the code of health uh, on the mobile phone. But for many old persons, they may not use mobile phones. They, they, don't, uh, they are not familiar with the code. So uh, even for the payment, when they purchase the, the goods on the internet, uh, it's, uh, very, it's very difficult for the old persons to, uh, to have, get the help or get the services or the purchase. So uh, how to encourage the old persons uh, to use the internet to follow up the, the trend of the development? It's also a big challenge. We need to have more policies on that. Uh, during the, the last uh, 
four or five months, I also had some interview by the radio or the TV to talk about that. In fact, uh, try to uh, use the online uh, ticket uh, by the train, by the, uh, the, the museums. Uh, they are also the obstacles for the old persons to, uh, to uh, prohibit them to, for some social activities. That's a new uh, topic for research and the policy, how to integrate the old persons in it. And uh, another part is the focus on the needs of the elderly, empowering the old person, uh, especially for education of the elderly. Last year, uh, in fact, the national education uh, plan for the long run, uh, least uh, uh, elderly education as part of the national education system. Uh, before that, the majority of the education for elderly was regarded as culture activities. It's not education programs, it's culture programs. So uh, it's very uh, important to give the opportunity, especially now we have a webinar, and in fact we have a many courses can be provided online. Uh, it also give uh, old persons more opportunities to learn from their uh, the, the various of uh, causes to sacrifice their knowledge uh, needs uh, for their learning. Uh, that's, uh, we need to have some policies for that. So that's some general introduction about the, uh, the background of population aging in China and the, the national strategies uh, try to uh, follow up the uh, sustainable development goals and the health in China 2030, and then the policy developments in China and uh, under the new framework of social governance of aging society, what we are trying to do uh, for the policy developments. So I will stop here to, uh, for any questions and comments. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Professor Zhu. Um, Now uh, we can uh, stop sharing your screen. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you for the very comprehensive overview of the uh, rapidly aging society in China. Indeed, this uh, trend is some experience that we have never mm -hmm. seen in uh, human histories. As you said, there would be uh, peak at 2055, probably with 500 million of uh, old people, older adults in the country, uh, particularly the oldest old, those who are 80 and above, uh, would be a really large proportion <coughs> of the, um, uh, the population in China. So this indeed is a huge challenge. And you've uh, given us an, a nice overview of how um, the responsibility of caregiving for older adults has been shifting from the traditional mode of uh, family care uh, to uh, government taking more responsibility, uh, communities taking more responsibility, and, and indeed the, the private markets taking up more responsibility too. The coordination and integration of all these services, of course, is a huge challenge. We also see that there's a lot more emphasis about uh, on the individuals themselves, the older adults, to take care of themselves, keep themselves he healthy, and uh, this lifelong learning uh, approach uh, was emphasized, which is uh, similar to what S Singapore was doing too. Um, I was interested in uh, your view about uh, the, the uh, strategy of extending the retirement age, uh, which you mentioned at the very end of your, your, your talk. And uh, as you say, people are still healthy at age uh, 60 and 65 and even probably 70s and so on. But the retirement age uh, remains very young, especially for women. And uh, that, uh, of course, is a huge uh, sources of human capital that uh, 
will do um, China well uh, in this rapidly aging society. So I was wondering why it's taking so long uh, for the government to take action in uh, adjusting these uh, retirement policies, uh, uh, extending the, the age. Uh, can you talk about that, please? Okay. And uh, let me also remind people to, uh, you can send in some questions through the Q&A uh, button at the uh, bottom of, the, uh, of your screen. Thank you. Professor Du, please. Sorry. Okay. Thank you for your comment and also the question. In fact, during my presentation, I, I, I listed it there. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, now I can uh, say more about explain the situation. In fact, uh, when we talk about population aging in China, uh, especially after we have huge number of pension uh, receivers, so uh, people talk more about the burden. So try to, uh, from that standpoint, they try to encourage the, they mentioned the postponement of the retirement age. But in fact, uh, uh, almost 20 years ago, that's in uh, 20, uh, 2002, uh, in November, uh, in January, I was in New York to, uh, on behalf of China to draft the, the action plan for the Second World Assembly on aging. I, I noticed, uh, and also we agreed, uh, there is one special article on that to have uh, uh, every country uh, try to have a flexible retirement system. So for flexible retirement system, it's, it's a great in China. Uh, in fact, in Shenzhen, in Beijing, uh, for some special groups of professionals, they already have the flexible retirement age. But for national policy, uh, when we try to postpone the retirement age, uh, we have to think about the new, uh, the young, gen uh, young generations, young people's employment, their job opportunities, to balance that with the postpone of the uh, retirement age. So uh, I want to give you a figure of that. Uh, this year, uh, almost uh, every year, 12, 12, 000, uh, 12 million new jobs created in the past two years. But this year, only for universities, we have uh, more than 8 million graduates. So um, that means the majority of the new jobs will be all occupied for these uh, graduates. Uh, so you have to secure these jobs to encourage the young people to have their jobs. And then that's why in the past one or two years, in fact, people talk about the delay the retirement age, but in fact, it's not possible at this stage uh, because more and more uh, young people, they, you, you have to have a job for them. At the same time, we don't have the system, the policy to postpone the retirement age. One, uh, one example I, I, I usually uh, give is in Beijing and Shanghai. Rarely you can see the uh, middle-aged persons to drive the taxi. But in, I'm not sure whether that's the same situation in Singapore, but in Japan, in Korea, you can see many old drivers around 17. So, uh, but in, in Beijing, it's impossible. Only young people, 30 or 40, they, they are the taxi driver. But what are the policies if we want to encourage the local drivers to join this team? So we need uh, not just a postponed retirement age, but how to have the new policies. We really appreciate their efforts, their contribution to the city and give them the opportunity. So that's why I mentioned uh, uh, we, we, we talk about the retirement age, but we need more policies and especially balance the jobs for young people to the job of old persons. Thank I see. You. I see. Uh, we also seen research says the uh, old people actually take up somewhat different jobs than the young people and that there may not be one-to-one -one, uh, replacement rate uh, in, in the labor market. But uh, coordinating this, of course, is very 
uh, a very big challenge, uh, which I definitely agree. Um, I realize that you're not able to send in um, ch questions through chat, but you can raise your hand uh, if you have um, a question and unmute yourself to ask the questions. May I uh, invite more questions, please? Uh, Dr. F uh, Professor Fong, please. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Du, for this uh, uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, I, I would I would rather you know ask you uh, you know in this way. Uh, I I have a question uh, about uh, because you are one of the main uh, scholars get involved into the national policy making uh, in China's uh, uh, aging matters. Uh, I would like to ask about the uh, the top design issues uh, for the future because uh, 50 years ago, I mean, uh, birth planning committee is very powerful agent in in the in the national government, <laughs> and now. It changed to population aging, but so far I see the national uh, aging committee is not as powerful as uh, you know the birth planning committee. So, in terms of pl uh, top design, uh, what will be your uh, suggestions or predictions in regard to the future of China? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, in fact, uh, since two years ago, uh, there are. Uh, some fundamental change for government agencies. One new agency is for uh, medical, uh, medical Security Bureau. It's National Bureau for Medical Security. They are in charge of the medical insurance and also the long-term care insurance. That's very independent the bureau, uh, separated from the uh, Social Security Ministry and from the Health Ministry. And then the as you mentioned, the family planning. In fact, they, they merged into the health, uh, public health ministry, and they formed uh, two new departments. They are, one is healthy aging. So they are in charge of the aging issues, and uh, especially the, the, to plan the family welfare for these old persons. Another is the family welfare, try to, because now uh, the national policies try to encourage young couples to have more children. But in fact, uh, due to, especially in cities, due to the higher cost and the changing uh, perception for childbearing. So we need to uh, need a lot of services mm -hmm. for uh, the kindergarten and also uh, su uh, subsidies for the childbearing. So these two government uh, departments, they from both sides, one for the old persons, one for, for the young couples and their families. In fact, they drafted and also they are very active for the policy making from these two perspectives. But by now, it's not so, uh, uh, the, the fertility level is not so ideal. Uh, still uh, lower than expectation. So uh, more policies or more welfare is, is uh, asked. <coughs> from. But I'm not sure whether it's, uh, uh, it's uh, working or not. But the direction is to give more support, more welfare along that way. In fact, there are many experience in Japan in Korea to encourage the fertility, uh, to raise the fertility is learned is noticed, uh, but still, uh, uh, in fact, um, for academic meetings or research, many research on the zero to three years old children, they are welfare and the family support uh, are done in the academics and the government policy research. So it's very interesting uh, direction. Uh, more actions, I think, in the next year may be taken by the government to encourage the, the fertility perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a, a question from the floor uh, uh, from Dr. Eileen Wong. Um, the medical cost is rising in China. Is there any move uh, or government policies to utilize more on the Chinese medicine, uh, given the demographic shift and the high cost? Okay. Is yeah, for the Chinese yeah. medicine. Uh, personally, and also from the research findings, I think the, the biggest achievements in the past five years, especially the last two or three years, they include 
the universal coverage of pension system. That means that every older person enjoy the uh, uh, the pension. So it's a very big achievement, uh, especially when you uh, think about the 500 million old persons by 2050. How to keep that sustainable is a huge challenge, but by now it's an achievement. The second is, as the question asked, uh, the medical insurance. In fact, in the past two years, 90% uh, medical cost can be reimbursed uh, by the insurance. So it's a fundamental change comparing to five years ago. That means uh, a, a, a very big achievement by the medical insurance system. And then the third is the, the Chinese traditional medicine. In fact, even for some chronic diseases, uh, last year and even uh, especially after the, this year's COVID-19 uh, pandemic, the Chinese traditional herbs uh, are more emphasized and uh, especially in the community services center, the medical services, they are encouraged to provide the traditional Chinese medicine. I, uh, and also, uh, I think that's a new era for Chinese medicine, uh, not just because the, the COVID-19 is uh, useful, it's working for this uh, disease, but also even we have a very modern uh, medicine for cancer, still uh, we need some Chinese medicine for, for the habitat to help the people to adjust to some uh, uh, syndromes uh, from syndromes from the medicine taken. Uh, so I think uh, it's very uh, bright future for Chinese uh, traditional medicine. Okay, I have another question that uh, says that family members are worried about sending uh, their older uh, fam you know, parents or grandparents to the elderly home because of the stigma. Um, would there be an ideology change, ideological change on philopiety in China in the near future, you think? Yeah. This is from Shuya, thank you. Yeah. It's also a very good question, and it's a dynamic changing uh, direction in China. Because when people talk about video piety, traditionally people think uh, we should provide care uh, as the family members to keep the old people at home. But in the past two years, both sides are changing. But for family members, the, the, the best practices of video piety is to guarantee their old parents to have the best service. It's not at home, but anywhere, maybe at the community center or at the nursing homes, if they can provide the professional care better than at home, that can be regarded as the filial piety. So not just as family members. On the other side is the nursing homes or apartments for the elderly, they try to uh, because of the maturing experience of their development. They have a better and better reputation, especially for some high quality nursing homes. So people realized it's not the traditional uh, village nursing homes, but it's very modern, very uh, with, uh, with dignity to live there, to get better uh, health, uh, better care. So from both sides' efforts, I think it's changing. Uh, but still, we can see a lot of arguments if you just uh, say, I send my parents to nursing homes. Many people will not understand why this happened. But for old persons, children, they know which is better for their parents. So I think that's a new tradition uh, changing to the more modern uh, perceptions. So I think that, uh, that it also gives uh, many opportunities for the new professional care providers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another question is uh, asked about the, um, are there, can you elaborate on policies for enabling the older adults other than uh, sending them to schools or education of the elderly, uh, Lauren, Laoling Ling Da Xue, for example, 
are there other ways to enable the older adults? Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, tomorrow I will go to Saishi province. They will have a national conference for uh, health, uh, or health or culture tourism forum. In fact, uh, for many uh, cities or villages, uh, they try to have the uh, old persons as the uh, volunteers, or they can have some uh, learning at the site uh, for tea making or growing or pottery making. So not just at the uh, U3A, University for Third Age, but also they can have more opportunities in the communities, uh, not just for uh, youth with aid, but also for volunteering uh, work in the communities. Thank you. Can you also talk about what are some of the strategies to integrate the uh, home-based care and community-based care better than, uh, uh, better than before, so they work more efficiently? Um, yeah, several people are wondering about how the integration issues and what are the more effective strategies to involve communities and home-based care. Okay, uh, home-based care, uh, in fact, is the, the biggest share uh, in the care, uh, uh, especially in the communities. But the, the policies are changing to to enable the nurses or medical professionals to, pro, uh, to visit their homes. In, in the past, due to the security reasons, it's prohibited. But now we, had, we have some good practices, especially in Qingdao, Shandong province. They have some uh, uh, doctors, local doctors, to tour the, uh, the old people at their home to give some uh, professional guide or diagnosis for these old people. Uh, especially in Shanghai, at the community levels, to, uh, and the Nanjing city, uh, they said it's uh, uh, without a war, the nursing home without a war. So to provide the first professional care but at their home. So that's the new uh, direction for many cities. Uh, but it depends on the insurance system and also the medical uh, authorities to uh, allow them to merge the medical and uh, social services. Uh, during the COVID-19, one challenge is uh, because old people, if they had some medical problems, but they could not go to the, uh, the hospitals, so if they go to the hospitals, maybe it's not difficult, it's not so easy to return back to nursing homes. It also amplified the need to have uh, integration of medical and social care at one place so that they can share the care responsibilities. Uh, many government authorities, uh, they already rethink about the integration after the COVID-19 how to merge that better. I think it's also part of the lesson from the COVID-19. Thank you. The uh, integration for the shifting boundaries of uh, care responsibility between family, uh, community, and uh, government, uh, and market, uh, NGO included, is uh, indeed a very big issue. There's also increasing concern about the isolation and loneliness of uh, older adults, uh, and particularly, well, I, I guess in, in both urban and um, rural um, areas in China. Can you talk about uh, how uh, chi Chinese government or chi China uh, plan to address these issues, please? And how prevalent uh, the issue is? Uh, about the... Uh, isolation and loneliness of yeah. older adults. The the long uh, so that uh, it's very good uh, direction. Uh, we follow that in rural areas. Uh, I can give you an example. So we followed in Shandong, Hebei, and the Shanxi province. Uh, uh -huh. Some rural areas, 
uh, one example is the uh, Sun Jiazhai in Xintai city in Kobe province. Uh, they have a, a dumpling uh, program. Dumpling. Dumpling. Uh, every uh, two weeks. So uh, okay. more than 1,000 old persons, they will uh, gather there to make dumpling. And they celebrate the birthdays and they have some uh, culture uh, performance or some health uh, education uh, during the half days. So it's very uh, uh, good example, uh, not just for the food of dumpling, but uh, a chance for the people to chat together, to know some new knowledge and to get some hair cutting, uh, free services. And so uh, the local government tried to copy that model uh, to more villages. We, every year we travel to there to see whether that's sustainable. On the other hand, only the old persons, they are left behind at the villages, but every old person, they have their piece of land. And the, the village, they pour that together to produce some foods and sell the products outside to make the money to, sus uh, to support they are dumpling program, service programs there. It's very interesting uh, experience for China try and uh, duplicate that model or to give the same spirit to more provinces. We can, uh, it's also grassroots level innovation from the villages. Uh, so uh, to solve the problem, not just uh, the isolation, loneliness, but also to give them daily care uh, needs, uh, support. Great. Can you talk, give us a, a specific example of how technology has been used? Please, you, you had talked about technology and some of okay. the su success stories before we wrap up. Okay. Uh, I think it's also uh, part of the COVID-19 uh, stories. <laughs> uh, due to the old people cannot go to the hospitals uh, and also it's very popular to have the online uh, uh, medical doctors to give diagnosis uh, from the internet. So the, uh, the policy is to uh, guarantee that can be uh, reimbursed the cost and then the old people do not need to travel to the hospitals to risk uh, the COVID-19 there. And uh, then that's a fundamental change for many old persons to have internet uh, medicine. Uh, and then they can uh, have the medicine from the hospital uh, from, uh, from by the delivery uh, to save their uh, time, especially to keep them safe at the home or nursing homes. That's the latest uh, 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 util uh, utilization of the internet. Great. Thank you, Professor Du, for giving us a very insightful uh, presentation. We got a lot of positive feedback for your talk, and uh, we have people from uh, who are interested in similar situations, probably in different scales, in other countries too. Uh, I have a question about Nepal and uh, different countries too. So I think you've given us a lot of uh, uh, fruits for, th for thoughts and uh, we really appreciate you joining us and, and we've learned a lot about China's uh, strategies and so on. So we're already five minutes over time. Uh, thank you so much for Professor Du's presentation and thank you everyone for your participation. And uh, in two weeks, uh, CFPR will have our next um, webinar uh, on the 28th, August 28th, uh, talked about affirmative action in Malaysia and South Africa. So please join us then. And uh, finally, let's give uh, Professor Du a round of applause if we can, or use your, <laughs> use your applause. Thank you. Uh, thank you, oh. Professor Du. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, we hope to have you back again in person next time. Thank okay. you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you.